really eat this thing. What? Speak up. I didn't say anything yet. <laughs> I wonder you can't hear me. I didn't say anything. I uh, I don't have my hearing aids on today. I guess the Lord made me forget those. I got up at 4.30 this morning, so I had plenty of time to prepare for the day, but uh, uh, I thought that might be part of my problem is that I hear myself perfectly well, and I don't know why you guys can't hear me. But uh, today I don't have men, so hopefully I will speak up loudly enough for you to hear me. But, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here, to be part of this body of Christ. Uh, we don't have the same level of fellowship on the mainland. We do fellowship, but it's not the same. You know? uh, and... Uh, going to miss you. And I, uh, you'll probably be ready to say goodbye to me when I get done with this message. But no. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome all of you. Um, you on Zoom as well. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and we invite you to, to prepare some elements for the communion later on if you're at home too. So you can join in with us. Uh, one of the aspects of the Lord's Supper is that it is a simple thing complicated, and it uses things that all of us have at hand. So that's what uh, I'm going to talk about this morning, is just kind of fill out a little bit, maybe, in your minds, um, in your hearts, what this uh, this thing is all about. Uh, we only have two uh, ordinances that, that we do in this church, and one is baptism, and uh, as Baptists, we believe in immersion baptism, and uh, that is a glorious one-time event uh, when you become a follower of Jesus, uh, representing your, your death in him as you go into the water, and your life in him as you come back out of the water. And it's a glorious time, and we've enjoyed many, many of them. I can look around this uh, this group and, and see many people that have been baptized right down here at Keokea, uh, mostly. But uh, the other thing is the Lord's Supper, and uh, it, too, is a, a very simple thing, but it's something that we do regularly. There's no uh, command on how often. We do it, but as often as we do it, we are doing it in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, this is just a short devotional to kind of get our hearts aligned with his heart this morning before we take the supper together. You'll turn with me in Matthew if you have your Bibles with you this morning. Going to get some more Bibles in case you forgot your Bible this morning. You're welcome to use your electronic Bible if you wish. Matthew chapter 26. I'm just reading a few verses there. Uh, this is all heading into the celebration of the, the initial Lord's Supper. Starting in verse 17, it says, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So the first thing that I want to just kind of bring to our attention to the forefront this morning is that, that Jesus plans ahead, and his plans always include us. This is, remember, uh, the context, the time context. This is the, the night that he is going to be betrayed. And... Uh, you can just imagine, because he knew, right? He had told his disciples that he was going to die. 
that he was going to be handed over to uh, wicked men and spiritual leaders, and they were going to kill him. But does he just zero in on that? No. He's zeroing in on the things that are at hand. His disciples are good Jewish men. They've always celebrated the Passover. And he's going to see that they pass over, celebrate that same Passover tonight. But what really impresses me about this is that Jesus shows his, his perfect composure, even though all this is in front of him, and he knows it's in front of him. I don't think there's any moment in our Lord's life when we realize more fully what the peace of God is in Jesus. You know, that uh, it tells us in uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. I guess we can turn to that too. I think a lot of you probably know this. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Philippians 4, back there after the Gospels. Corinthians, then you get into the small letters of Paul. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. We've been studying this in our small group, so it's been on our hearts week by week as we study it. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be being known unto God. And the peace of God and this is the part that I'm going to emphasize, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We cannot really understand how God has the depth of, of the peace that God has in his heart. I mean, we get an, an inkling of it right here because Jesus is experiencing, I think, this peace of God. He is God, and he has a peace that is beyond our understanding. I don't care if you're a saint and have been a saint all your life. If you were born again when you were a little tot, you still will not be able to understand the depth of this thing called the peace of God. But we can witness it. We can witness it, how he, he transforms that into the life of other people, maybe more than in our own lives, how that we can have that, that deep peace of God. And we can experience it... Uh, we can witness it as, as we experience and our, our, as our Lord Jesus experiences it on this night. Spurgeon says, what is God's peace? The unruffled serenity of the infinitely happy God. The eternal composure of the absolutely well-contented God. The being who needs nothing, who can do everything, and who holds it all within his being, that he is not ruffled, that he has anxiety is not in his personal vocabulary or description. So remember again, this is a night on which he was betrayed. Betrayal is a hard thing. For any of you that have felt that from a friend or from even family, and Jesus, who had never sinned, now all of us have been coarsened by sin. Sin hardens our hearts, you know. So we don't have any idea the, the softness, the, the receptivity of Jesus' sinless heart. And yet he is going to be betrayed by one of his own, you know. I might mention one of those that he has, has nurtured along for these three years in his public ministry. So that's before him. We know that... Uh, the dark clouds of Calvary are, are closing in quickly. You know, night is coming, and with that night, we know kind of what's ahead. Jesus knows what's ahead. So this last great agony that Jesus is going to suffer had begun. This great struggle that we know will close in his crucifixion in the grave. But still, in all this, Jesus exhibits supreme calmness. Again, he is more concerned about others as he is trying to teach us to be, you know, to love others more than we love ourselves. He is putting the emphasis on the others. 
to give them this, this thing that they can hold on to in the future, which is the Lord's Supper. We don't see any trace of, of fever or fret in Jesus. He is just supremely calm. The Lord is at leisure from himself, as that old saying goes. And he institutes this memorial for his own people. That should teach us that nothing on heaven or earth can check the love of Jesus for his children. Nothing, not even the most dire circumstance we can imagine for our Lord, will check his love for his children. He tells us to love others, and he demonstrates what that love is by every action that he did. He had thought of them. He had planned ahead for them. You know, who is this person that opens her house to him? Jesus knew. I don't think any of the disciples knew. But Jesus had planned ahead, you know. He, he, he goes before us. You know, he's our foreguard that prepares a way for us. He'll think of them, and he'll not only plan for them for that night, but he will plan for them for the forever future. This concern wasn't just for that evening, it was for forever. We sometimes how wonder how Christ can, can even think of us, you know, with all the magnitude of the world and every all the billions of people that are on the earth, and he can still care for us as if we were his only one. That is a mystery that we'll never be able to really comprehend. David asked centuries before, back in Psalms, Psalms 8, Psalms right in the middle of your Bible. Chapter 8 is right in the beginning of Psalms. David wondered about such things and expressed it as poetically as can be expressed, I think, where he says uh, in verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You know, that's us. That, that's our position. How can God be mindful of us? Well, because he's God, right? So David understood that. David had to keep reminding himself of that. And so do we, I think. When we recall that night, that night of betrayal, these fears that we might have of, of God not being in control or not knowing all that was going to befall, they take wings and fly away. If uh, ever a heart might be self-centered on that night, it was then. But yet Jesus took and break and gave to the disciples. Secondly, Christ just demonstrated a very quiet confidence in the future, which is equally notable, this confidence that he had not only in what was going to happen that night, but what was going to occur in the future. You know, I'm sure that some, if not most of the disciples were already beginning to wonder because Christ had been telling them about the perils of this night and how it was going to end in his death. They had to be thinking, was this, was this just a fine terrain that we had? Is, were we just following a visionary, but now it's going to all end? I'm sure his enemies were thinking that. His enemies that had already made a deal with one of his disciples, that they, he would betray them. I can see them rubbing their hands, you know, saying, ah, to finally, finally, we're going to shut up this, uh, this prophet, this one that's drawing people away from us into a new life. Uh, because I'm sure that they pictured this is going to do it. We're going to do them away. We're going to kill them. And that'll be the end of all of our troubles. Just wait for that signal that they're going to get from the one that will betray them. And that, if they were sure of anything, they were sure that would be the end of it. They wouldn't have done this otherwise. They wouldn't have inspired the, the audience to do that crowd. And I don't think there was a, a soul in Jerusalem that night that thought that there was a glorious future for our Lord. But what, uh, what are we told? What did Paul tell us over in 1 Corinthians? 
back in the New Testament, right after the Gospels and Romans, we get into 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, and verse 25. Jesus is instituting the supper, and he says, this cup, this is Jesus speaking, he says, this cup is the New Testament, the new agreement, the new deal, and my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, Jesus is saying, there's going to be a future. And in this future, you're going to remember who I am and what I did on this night. It's going to be key. It's going to be key in your life. So Jesus took the third cup of the Passover. Okay, back a couple of chapters, or one chapter, in 10, 16, and 17. Look back there for a minute and see what he said about this cup. He said, this third cup was called the cup of blessing. And the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For thee, for we, I'm sorry, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So what Paul's telling us here is there's a communion in taking this cup together. What's communion? Communion means to have in common, to participate, to have partnership with. We have partnership with one another, and we have partnership with Christ. Through this communion, coming together as one and taking the one bread and the one body that we all partake of. What is the blessing, the cup of blessing? The blessing is our salvation. This is what it's all about, isn't it? That we are saved from our own sins. So he was confident that his name was going to last as long as the sun endured. He was confident that from age to age his memory would be cherished. and Men would love him and would serve him and would die for him through the long years until he came again where we are today. I can't help but feeling that this was more than human. I know of no parallel in history, you know, in the little bit I know about history. And Cicero was deeply concerned to think what men might think of him 600 years after his death. Cromwell believed his institutions would last forever. Napoleon knew that the world would wonder at him, but he knew that they would never love him. Christ alone, Christ betrayed and crucified, saw the love and worship going on for centuries until he comes again. Back to Colossians 11.26, again it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So Jesus is projecting that out into the future. That is going to keep happening. We are the future. We're 2,000 years of the future. And we are still celebrating this with all sobriety and, and uh, depth of meaning this day. The third thing is that it's, it's simple. I mentioned that earlier, the simplicity of this memorial. You know, it, it, it is so fitting because our, our, our salvation is not difficult. And this ordinance, this memorial, is simple as simple can be. There's no pomp. There's no elaborate ritual about it. It's just a simple and very homely deed. Old Testament things are a little bit different. When they uh, celebrated the Passover, it was full of uh, striking uh, events. There's blood was flowing. Altars, animals were being dragged to altars and, and resisting their, their being sacrificed. Uh, altars were raised. The blood of peace was shed. A thousand significant details. But in the New Testament, all that's done away with, isn't it? Amen. Amen. We don't have to do all that. The sacrament is simplicity itself. Well, I'd, you know, this should be hard to understand. Let's, uh, let's suppose that you're in a family and, and there's a family friend that you've never met, but that uh, 
your family, your parents have been telling you about for years and years. And they try to tell you in every detail how you're going to love this family friend. That he has just uh, done all these amazing things for them. He's done amazing things for you that you weren't even aware of. They describe what he looks like, you know, and, and uh, just, just every detail that they can think of of this family friend in great detail. But then one day, the friend comes to visit, and you get to meet them. Well, now you've seen the friend. You have met the friend. You've experienced that for yourself. So no longer do you need your parents to describe to you what this family friend is like because you've met them. And that's what makes all the difference. Jesus has been met. You know, the greatest communication that God ever made to man was Jesus. You know, you want uh, to understand what man is like or you want to understand what God is like? Have him come visit you in the flesh. And that's what happened, you know. And we're still celebrating that here today, aren't we? Amen. <laughs> what, a, what an event. So the Old Testament is things that were yet to come, but yet no eye had seen them in the flesh. The New Testament men had seen and know him. And the simplest thing serve as a memorial. The simple thing of bread and wine. Number four, he saw his body and blood and bread and wine. Again, think it was a very Christ-like thing to do for, for Christ to name these two elements about his body and his blood. It speaks to the royal hopefulness of Jesus that he found such meanings in just a piece of bread. You know, it seems like this bread thing was with Jesus right from the beginning. Where was he born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. Yeah. And where was he laid in Bethlehem? In a feeding trough, you know. <laughs> Jesus, uh, right from the get-go, is, is uh, about bread. Bread is, is interwoven in his life. Back in Micah, that's a little bit harder to find. How do we find Micah? Well, after Jonah. Okay, Jonah, Obadiah, there I am. I'm getting close. I just kind of leaf through until I get there. Back in Micah and chapter 5 and verse 2. Again, hundreds of years before the coming of the Messiah, Micah says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me. Out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel. You know, a definite prophecy right there that Jesus was going to come through Bethlehem, through the house of bread. That out of you shall come forth the, to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Who's going forth from old, from everlasting. Who was from everlasting appointed to be there. And was and is and ever will be the bread of life and the living bread to his people. Titles that he had given to himself through his ministry. Whoever shall eat of this bread shall live forever. And it says over in John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 6, and verse 58. John 6, 58 says, This is that bread, Jesus speaking again, saying, This be I am, that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus is talking about himself. He's not talking about the elements that we are remembering him by. But again, bread is representative. That we need bread to live. We need the bread of heaven to live eternally. That's what feeds our soul. That, that's what gives us that passport into his kingdom. On Oliver Goldsmith's monument, these words are written. Nihil tetjet quod non ornavit. Excuse my Latin. 
He touched nothing that he did not adorn. He touched nothing that he did not adorn. That's Oliver Goldsmith. And that may have been true in Goldsmith, but with our Savior, it is a lot more noble than what Goldsmith ever did. Everything that Jesus touched, he adorned. You think about, as Tricia sang this morning, you know, all the, the, the different groups of people that their lives are different today because of Christ. Women. Think of women and the status of women before Christ. Think of the status of women in religions that, that aren't Christian. Some are very uh, vividly. Think of children. Children were elevated by the touch of Christ. Think of the poor. Think of the, the sickly, the handicapped. All these were, were people that were discarded, as our society may want to do today, but we know we stand against that because... We follow Christ, and Christ has touched every life and said that life is precious because that life is made in the image of God. Whether you're saved, born again, or you're, you're the, the worst sinner the world can imagine, you're still carrying that image that God created you in, and that makes you noble. That makes you worthwhile. That makes you touched by the hand of God. And that, uh, okay, for so let, let, let's look at some examples of what Jesus did in his life. Remember at Cana, his first miracle, what did he do? He changed water to wine. That's right. And now, through his public ministry, he has now taken that wine upon the table, and he's saying it's a symbol of his blood. From water to wine, from wine to blood. Jesus elevated the whole concept of what uh, this water, wine, Upward trend is all about. Jesus touch, transform. So it's no wonder that the world started to bloom and blossom under the gaze of somebody that understood. So he said, if a mustard seed can be the kingdom in disguise, what can that little child be? You know, what what's that uh, poor and broken body? If my body is represented by the bread. That can be broken so easily. There's still a chance for broken characters. And it's true that we're all saved by hope. And Jesus gives us that hope. And uh, it's wonderful, the hopefulness of Jesus. But for you young people, that's what makes him the ideal comrade, is that he will never shorten his hope for you, the hope that you have in your life. Here I am, you know, in the later 70s, and I, I still have that hope in me. You know, my spirit is still as young as it was when I was your age, you young guy. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a phenomenal thing. Your spirit doesn't age. You know, your body might start falling apart and looking old as sand, but, uh, you know, your, your spirit doesn't. It's, it stays young because it is eternal. Our spirits aren't aging. They are uh, just getting... Uh, I, I like what we heard last week in our in our Bible study is that we're not humans having a supernatural experience. We are we are not human beings having a supernatural experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. This is just a kind of a temporary thing that we're experiencing here. This is our human experience, but this isn't us. This is where we're going. This is just a, a little foretaste that we have what God has in store for us. Yeah, hallelujah. So, number five, the feast, of course, spoke of his death. And this is the last of the, the different aspects I want to bring out, is that uh, it was his death that Jesus chose to be remembered. You know, you think of all the, the great figures, the great personalities of history. How do we remember them if we remember them? We remember, remember them by their birth date. That's what we celebrate for one another is our birth date, you know. But Jesus didn't say, let's celebrate my birth. I know the world has taken that and run away with it because it has something to do with gift giving. But, but you know, the greatest holiday, that, that the greatest event that we celebrate as Christians is Easter is the rising of Jesus from the dead. That was when all of history changed. That's when it was finished, when his work was done. 
But you know, if there's one thing that sensitive hearts would shrink from, and we still do, I uh, read that gospel of Mark this morning about the crucifixion of Jesus. And it, it's hard, hard reading. I don't care how many times you read it. When you know who Jesus is and what Jesus went through for us to be forgiven of our sins and knowing that our sins was the cause of that, it's an awful scene. Crucifixion is an awful scene. You know, uh, we never, sensitive souls that we are, I think, could have endured to look on Calvary. And yet, Calvary is what we commemorate. I hope this story helps to explain it. I might have told you this before, but it's, it's a precious story. There was a lady who was very beautiful, all excepting of her hands, which are misshapen and marred. Many a long day, her little daughter had wondered what was the meaning of these repulsive hands. At last, she said to her mother, I love your face, and I love your eyes, and your hair. They are so beautiful. But I cannot love your hands. They are so ugly. And then the mother told her the story about her hands. How ten years ago the house had taken fire and how the nursery upstairs was in a blaze and how she had rushed to the cradle and snatched the baby from it and how her hands from that hour had been destroyed. And the baby saved was her little listening daughter. Then the daughter kissed the shapeless hands that she used to shrink from before she knew their story. And she said, Mother, I love your face and your eyes and your hair. But I love your hands now best of all. Doesn't it kind of remind you that how Jesus and how he met with Thomas and how he carried his marred body after the resurrection. This is Jesus' resurrection body. You know, when we have our resurrection body, any scars we have, anything that this world has done to us will be gone. Our bodies are going to be perfect. We're going to be, can't we just wait <laughs> for that day? Yeah. Uh, but Jesus takes his into eternity. Back in John is where this occurred. John chapter 20. Just back a couple of pages in your Bible are now, talks about when he appeared to his disciples on the day that he resurrected, and again, he's now in his resurrection body, he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, reach your hand here and put it into my side, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Allow me to personalize. I don't want you to turn. I want you just to listen to Isaiah 53, 5. And I'm going to substitute a personal pronoun instead of uh, the one that is there. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement for my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. You know, we have a very personal God, and he would die, have died for you if you were the only one that needed his rescue. But we can all be so grateful that we have one another to encourage us on this, this journey together. And... Uh, so let's, uh, let's bow and, and ask the Lord to bless this message and, and to bless this communion table together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you cared so much for us and that you left us with the command to be like you and to care for each other and to love each other, Lord, uh, as you have loved us with that uh, that fathomless love that is the the solve that uh, encourages our souls and gives us hope for all those that don't know you 
that your love covers them as well. I thank you for this table. Thank you for inviting us to remember you and to share with one another, to be of one body, to be of one bread in this life that we live, that we are not separated by our attitudes, by our personalities, but we have a higher calling, and that's that calling that you gave us, to be your sons and daughters. pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, um, as we have been doing in recent times, that I'm going to invite you to come forward and, and take a morsel of bread and a, a cup and return to your seat, and then we will uh, take this solemn event together and uh, just go back and, and spend some time with the Lord while we're waiting for everybody. took bread and he gave thanks and he break it he give thanks and then break it and give thanks he gave unto them saying this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me Thank you, Father, for hanging on the cross for us, for shedding your blood for us. Thank you for the cleansing power of your blood, that it is the power of heaven to save our souls. And bless this cup now. Likewise, also the cup after supper said, This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Thank you, Guy. That was beautiful and very meaningful. And uh, especially for me on my birthday to be able to share the Lord's Supper with my my uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's a, a great blessing. You know, uh, I remember the saying that says, born once, die twice. Born twice die once. And uh, yes, because of the, the blood of Christ and forgiveness, uh, we don't have to fear the second death. Amen. Our sins have been judged. We've been forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming today. If, uh, if you're able to stand or would like to stand, Please do, and I'll pronounce the benediction. You know, in this benediction, uh, Paul speaks of the communion, the communion of the Holy Spirit. And just as we have communed with, with God and uh you know, together in remembering uh, his sacrifice, his blood and body. Uh, may the communion of the Holy Spirit continue to keep you. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus today and throughout this week. God bless you.